Hey everybody, uh, this is a podcast from Gary DeMar. He's got a podcast on um, Google and Apple Music. This episode in and of itself isn't on YouTube. He's got some of his content on YouTube. He's been on my channel several times talking about mostly end times and eschatology and uh, post-millennialism and all that. Though he doesn't really like the term. I'm not a crazy fan of the term either because it's not just about the millennium, but we kind of go that way. I don't know, pre-mill, on-mill, whatever. Anyway, point is, uh, this is a really good conversation about Christian nationalism and just patriotism and being a good Christian citizen, an American citizen per se, but a Christian citizen. And uh, I know Doug Wilson's talked to NBC recently, and they're freaking out and all weirded out about it. You know, now it's Christian nationalism is a bad thing, not just nationalism and loving your country, but Christian nationalism, as if we're going to force people kind of like a a Sharia law, but for Jesus, you know, with sprinkles and chocolate sauce on top of, you know, but it's all Jesus flavored Sharia law or something. I, I don't know. We've done this before. They did this in Europe. It's not always been a hundred percent, right? But at the same time, secularism and godlessness and deism and, and atheism and all these things clearly are not a good alternative. And they've, we've seen that in the last 200 years. So, um, hope this finds you well. It's a very good podcast and you can go find it on Apple or Google as well. I sped it up slightly just for the sake of time. Um, but again, enjoy this. I, I encourage you to check out Gary Damar, and I've got a few other conversations on here, and also my sister channel, uh, Contra Talk with Richard, which is just exclusively uh, conversations. So anyway, take care, like and comment if you don't mind, Uh, this helps the algorithm out, and uh, sub to this channel if you haven't already, because I've got lots of content similar to this, all right? See ya. And you are podcasting with Gary Damar. Let's figure things out. Welcome to the Gary DeMar Podcast. I'm Eric. That's Gary. And uh, Gary has just held up a book that he would like to talk about today. It's uh, by a, a, a guy that you've debated a number of times, Michael uh, Brown. Uh, yeah, Michael Brown, The Political Seduction of the Church, How Millions of, how millions of American Christians Have Confused Politics with the Gospel. And it's, this isn't the only book that's come out on this topic. There's, there seems to be many, uh, many others. Richard Mao, uh, How to Be a patriotic christian love of country as love of neighbor okay and then tony evans kingdom politics returning god to government and uh paul miller with a forward by david french uh, the religion of american greatness what's wrong with christian nationalism okay so this is this is the new this is the new byword christian nationalism and uh these books are these books are frustrating. Even even the one by by uh, Michael Brown, uh, and and there's an there's an article there's an article on uh, Faithwire that says only Jesus can save America. Michael Brown's pressing message to Christians across the nation. Okay, and I I find people saying that you know we you know Christians just need to be Christians. Okay, the gospel just needs to be the gospel. Okay, what, what does that what, what does, does that mean? What does that mean? Right. Um, you are born again. Well, if you're born again, that is the beginning of the process, right. not the end of the process. There's a lot that happens once you are born the first time. Right. Yeah. A lot of maturity and growth that needs to happen. E- exactly. And along the way, you mature, you gain experience, and you you exercise the gifts and talents that God has given you. You operate in terms of, of God's Word in every area of life. Now, wh- why is that different in your in your spiritual spiritual growth in terms of the world at large yeah well and and the new testament even even addresses us in the book of hebrews i i mean it's it's not a good thing that you're still drinking milk yes it's not a good thing that, that you're not on a solid food and eating meat you know i i i have to go back and, and readdress the basics with you because you aren't mature you because you haven't gotten to where you're supposed to be yet. yeah yeah and we'll look we'll look at that that passage in a little in a little more detail so in this particular article um Dr. Brown says, I agree that we're dealing with ex- existential issues. I agree that there's, a, there's, that there's a battle for life, the battle for family, international issues, Israel. There are massive things. But despite realizing one party or candidate might better align on these issues, uh, Brown, author of the new book, The Political Seduction of the Church, How Millions of American Christians Have Confused Politics with the Gospel, issued an important caveat about the dangers of putting trust in politics. And here's what Dr. Brown said. When we put our trust in the political system to change society, when we become more consumed with winning the elections than winning the lost, 
when we marry the gospel with politics, when our Christianity becomes an appendage to a political party, we have confused politics with the gospel. True. Absolutely true. Yeah. But is that is that what's happening? I mean, that that's that's what the issue is yeah. here. Um, and people I run into is they they just they feel like what's happening. Well, they don't feel like it. They see what's happening is is that the national the the the, the, the civil government of our nation has become a beast. Mm-hmm. And as a result, the beast needs to be tamed. The beast needs to be caged. Uh, you and so you ha- you get involved in 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 politics uh, in in the sense to chain down the beast. Right. Uh, Thomas Jefferson talked about uh, uh, because of the nature, uh, the, of, because of human nature, civil leaders need to be chained down by the a constitution. Yeah. Th- that's why that's why we're involved in, in politics. In fact, I think one of the reasons why we weren't involved in politics is because that much you really didn't need to be i mean the what was happening politically in our nation the democrats and the republicans back in the 50s and 60s and even into the 70s really they weren't that they weren't there wasn't a radical difference in the in the two parties socially yeah, ex- yeah socially yeah. yeah you 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 know we had republicans and democrats that created these huge these huge programs and so forth most people didn't see the civil government as a threat now there were people out there who saw the threat, and a lot of people, and many people didn't listen to them. Yeah. Uh, so then you you get to you get the Jimmy Carter's administration, uh, and you know Ronald Reagan comes on the scene, and Christians Christians get involved. It was really the first time during Jimmy Carter's administration, I think, that there was an evangelical voting bloc. Okay. That was that was that was new. Um, there was there's always been kind of a Roman Catholic voting bloc and a Jewish voting bloc, um, but there wasn't an evangelical voting bloc because evangelicals. We're kind of told we don't get involved in politics, okay. uh, and that was you know, part of the problem. And, and when I try to get when I when, when I talk about getting involved in politics, it isn't so. Oh, we Christians need to get involved in politics so that we can take over the power bases and take over the, right. the money, and we can use those for our benefit. Exactly. Yeah. That's not what that's not what we teach, and I don't know anyone else who teaches that either. Right. Uh, the, the the goal to get involved politically is to tame the beast, to get involved in the, the the political apparatus in order to stop what's happening at the national level and in many cases at the state level, and what they're doing to families and, and education and uh, uh, crime and so forth. I don't know anyone. I've never heard anybody considering that getting involved in, in politics is somehow going to save us. That, that's not. I, I just don't know anybody who believes anything like that. Yeah, in fact, we got a um, we got we got copied on an email that that a supporter, a listener, sent to uh, a publisher, and uh, the in this in this book the uh, it's a, it's an economics book, but they're talking about theonomy or reconstructionism, and it says Christian reconstructionists maintain that the church should rule society, and his and he copied this on us because he, he basically said, well, this isn't. <laughs> this yeah. isn't what Reconstruction is actually believed. No, they, you know, we believe in a jurisdictional separation between church and state. The, the, this has always been the case. Uh, you will find in the Bible a jurisdictional separation between church and state. You have Moses and Aaron. They had two separate jurisdictions in which they applied God's law. And you, know, Moses, and you see that all the way up even, even until— um, the 17, 1800s with the with with the whole sword and the scepter and and there there's there, there's two there's two individual you know both both have authority in in their own in realms. their own spheres yeah. yeah and and the fact that the civil magistrate has the sword you want to make sure that you are very specific on what the civil magistrate ought to do because every time you give more power and authority to the civil magistrate the guy with the sword he can then wield that sword in order to force compliance in those new powers and the new authority that you, you gave to them, and the same thing would happen if you if you gave all that authority back over to the church, you, you you'd have you have Islam. It, well, yeah, you have right. There is no jurisdictional separation between church and state in Islam, uh, and, and and by the way, the First Amendment to the Constitution isn't dealing with the separation between church and state. That was already a given. The, the First Amendment to the Constitution deals with the relationship between the national government and the state governments. And uh, you know that's why it says Congress shall make no law respecting uh, 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 respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. It has nothing to do with church-state relations. Uh, and again, I, I'm certainly not calling on the the church to run things. I mean, churches churches have their own internal problems. Sure. And by the way, yeah. by the way, 
the, the, the sins that you see at the civil, the civil sphere are the same sins that you find in, in the ecclesiastical sphere. Mm-hmm. And the same qual- qualifications for leadership in the, in the ecclesiastical sphere are the same ones that you would expect and hope for in the, in the civil sphere. Right. So you look at First, first Timothy chapter 3, the, what's, what's, what starts? What's, what, what's the beginning of all this? A person's character. Right. How they govern themselves. Yeah, if you can't govern yourselves, yep. you can't govern others. If you can't govern your own family, which is a government in and of itself, how then are you going to govern other families? Right. I mean, this is this is this is biblical theology 101. Yeah, it ain't rocket science. No, it yeah. isn't that <laughs> difficult at all. And I don't know why, you know, j- just because a a religious leader or somebody, you know, a lot of people say, oh, what we need to do is just preach the gospel. Okay, we just preach the gospel. What's the gospel? Yeah, and and so let's say. Uh, uh, you got ninety-eight percent of the people. Ninety-eight out of a hundred uh, people are Christians. Okay, but they're not in. They don't want to be involved politically because they're just about the gospel. So that means two percent aren't. Two two percent are just secular materialists. And you've then now turned. You've turned the government over to the two percent. Well, you're still just preaching the gospel. You're. They're still keeping their two percent. You know, we we have our ninety-eight percent, and you might say, well, we'll have a better. We'll have a, a the, the world will look better in many respects in that way. That's the case. That's true. But if you give power to those two percent, that two percent then can put restrictions on the ninety-eight percent. Sure. And do you really want them governing you? I, you know, I don't. And if the if the if the two percent then say, well, what we're going to do? We're going to tax you at 40 percent and redistribute it to the two percent, or we're going to we're going to shut down your churches and so forth, and we're going to use the military in order to do all that. You see the problem here. Just because you're a Christian does not necessarily mean that that is going to impact the civil sphere of government unless you are involved in it in some way. Well, but it, it, it misses the whole point, in, in, in my view, because if you go out there and you, quote unquote, preach the gospel, well, what does that mean? Uh, you need to be saved. Saved from what? What, what do you mean? What's, what's wrong with me? Why do I need to be saved? Oh, you, you need to be saved because you're a sinner. No, I'm not. Okay. And then you, then you convince that person that they are, in fact, a sinner. And you get them to become, okay, I guess I do need Jesus t- to be saved from the, the, the pits of hell. You know, I, I, that sounds bad. I don't want to go there. All right, now, now I'm a Christian. Now, now, I've, now I've been saved. What, what, what happened to me on an in, in individual level, my recognition of the fact that, 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 I, that, that there is something wrong with me, that there's something fractured. I don't think the right way. I don't act the right way. Got it. Okay, so Jesus saves me from these because he died for my sins on the cross. Now... That happened to me individually, but but that is happening socially. When you get a bunch of people together who who either recognize or don't recognize that that they're sinful, their actions together for, that's what a society is. It's a it's it's, it's people acting in concert with, right. with 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 one another. So if all you're going to do is try and convince people, I, I guess just to save them from hell, well, all right, now you've convinced them of that. Well, now what? Okay, now now that I've been saved, now should my life look different? Should I? Should, yeah, should, yeah. Should should life in general be different? What do I do now? Yeah, yeah and 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 that and that's the whole point that that's missing in all this. It, it's not just about somebody saying that's right. I'm a I'm a Christian. I go to church every Sunday. Well, but there should be some result, like in the like in the first century church, they were turning the Roman Empire upside down. Why were they doing that? Because they were acting differently. They were they were doing things differently because they thought differently. Um, they were their their sin problem was dealt with, and they wanted to do something different. And and that, so what is that? Is is not getting involved in politics? How, how does that? How does that? How does that work out? What it doesn't get to the core issue. Yeah. What? Yeah. What now? Sort of thing. And I, look, this this isn't anything new, and it just just came to mind because the the word the political seduction of the church, and b- back in the uh, '80s, uh, Dave Hunt wrote a book, "The Seduction of Christianity: yeah. Spiritual Discernment in the Last Days." And it kind of this this debate that's going on today kind of reminded me of David uh, Dave Hunt's The Seduction of Christianity, uh, and but your yeah. but your response with Peter Lightheart is has has more pages, so it, yeah. it, it, it 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 must be true. Well, the original the original title of this was The Reduction of Christianity. You see, okay. and I think this is what's kind of happened with all this sort of thing. You can talk about seduction. That's okay. I don't have any problem with that. But you better have a remedy for it. Yeah. Uh, you know, it, it is easy being a critic. 
it's easy being a critic. What's what's difficult is what's more difficult is to be a a a a, a, a practical an activist. Uh, well, I'm trying to think of the word. I had it on, on the tip of my, my tongue. Um, a, a, a somebody who involves in the solution that what you're critical of something. You know, you someone comes into the office who's continually a, cri- a critic of things. People get tired of it. What's oh, what's the oh, what's the yeah. solution here? Yeah, okay, I'm, I'm a critic, not a problem solver. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so this is a so, hey. Here, why don't you try this, or why don't you try that? Let's 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 try this. Now, let's let's implement this. I think Steve Jobs was a was a uh, was was like that. He he saw something he wanted done, and then he he gave. Let's do this. Right. Uh, and if you if you go back and look at the history of all of this, I can't remember the name of the movie. I can't, the, the the documentary. But they they kept this. I think it was called the red the red book. And all of these all of these uh, uh, examples of how to how to do things. And you see the beginning of the iPhone and all that in there. If, it's not enough just to be a critic. I want to know specifically what you have as a solution to what you saying we're being seduced. Right. What are you going to do now? Okay. So now we're back to Jesus and Jesus. And, and I think it was uh, John MacArthur who wrote a book. Uh, uh, Government can't government can't save you or something. Yeah, why, why government can't yeah, save us? Yeah, and I'm th- who's who's calling for that? Right now, there may be said pe- it could. Yeah, yeah, there may be people who are seduced by politics if they just got a new president in, everything would be okay. So we were, so uh, Peter Lightheart and I wrote a book called The Reduction of Christianity, and the original title was Dave Hunt's Theology of Cultural Surrender. Okay, um, and this particular book is it's still we still we still sell. It. In fact, at the time when it came out. In 1988, we couldn't keep this thing in print. Well, we'll tell we'll tell the story why there had to be a why, why you had to change the oh it's, the subtitle. It's, it's, I can't find the the uh, the, the, the the new one, uh, but the uh, it was, I think it was Har- I think it was Harvest House. So Harvest House didn't like the subtitle because it gave the impression that the reduction of Christianity was. That Dave Hunt had written was, this was book. a new book by Dave Hunt. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> even though it says underneath it, Gary Demar and Peter Lightheart in much bigger letters. So we changed it. We changed changed the color scheme and we changed the. Come buy my new book yeah. on cultural <laughs> surrender. I, I wrote it, says Dave Hunt. Now remember, this was written in 1988. Uh, so he's looking 30, 20, 30, 40, 34 years. Is he 90? 34 years ago. Yeah. 34 years ago. Wow. And. And so I'll give you some of the, the, the table of contents here. Orthodoxy, setting the record straight. Let's define our terms. Crying wolf. What is this? Was all about the new about new age humanism. New age humanism, a kingdom counterfeit. About conspiracies, guilt by association, the timing of the kingdom. Dave Hunt's heavenly kingdom. Myths of militancy. The kingdom is now. From the church fathers to the Reformation. From the American Puritans to the Revolution. The zenith and decline of optimism, turning the world right side up, building a Christian civilization. This book is as up to date, other than the fact that it dealt with the New Age movement and so forth, or the claim that those people who were trying to change society were involved in the New Age movement. But it's the same rhetoric that's that's been used. Yeah, it, it really is a, a a great primer on the Christian worldview. Yeah, I mean it's a it's a very comprehensive book. So the new, the the or the or the, the second the second ed- edition of that book. Um, the first edition was Dave Hunt's Theology of Cultural Surrender, which is the subtitle. The new subtitle is A Biblical Response yeah. to, to Dave Hunt. And I debated Dave Hunt numerous times. And, of course, um, both Michael Brown and the late Dave Hunt hold to an eschatological position that we're living in the last days. And if you noticed in the, the article that you know Israel is a big, big, plays a big role in his, in his deal, that everything focuses on Israel and that Israel is going to – this whole – and they're not. Uh, Dave Hunt, I think, was a pre-tribulationalist. Um, uh, Michael Brown is a post-tribulationalist. But their eschatology doesn't afford them the um, the roadmap to bring about fundamental changes in society. Yeah, because not only is it ultimately a, a uh, an eschatology of defeat, it's a it's an in- inevitable. Defeat. Right. There, there's, there's just no way you can right. avoid so it. So what you do is you just let's just stick with preaching the gospel. Right. Let's do the Great Commission and so forth. Although the Great Commission says we're the the, the nation is supposed to be disciple. Disciple. What does that mean? I know. And so I, look, I, I, I haven't read, I haven't read all these these books, uh, but it's it's just it's going to come down to, it's going to come down to, the specifics on how you go about all of this. Um, he deals with uh, let's see 
The church is the church called to take over society. I haven't read this chapter yet. This is chapter 12 of Michael Brown's book. Um, and I don't know. Let's see. Oh, he actually quotes Rush Juni. Still, others relate to these words in a much more literal way, understanding them to mean that the church is called to take over the world. Okay. As, a, as expressed by R.J. Rush Dooney. And he quotes Rush Dooney. Again, I haven't read this. I'm just picking this up now. Our responsibility is to exercise dominion, which means to declare where sovereignty resides and to declare God's sovereign world, the world, the word of dominion to every area of life and thought. And we are promised that when we go forth in terms of that word, the commission tells us, the commission to Joshua, which our Lord summarizes then later, that if we go into the power of his word and faithfulness, to, to to it wherever the sole of our feet shall tread, that shall be your ground. Let's plant our feet on the face of all the earth and claim it for Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, yeah, <laughs> that is different. That is different from saying. Still, others relate these words, quoting Michael Brown, in a much more literal way, understanding them to mean that the church is called to take over yeah. the world. Yeah, that's, that's just not. That's not true. Right. We believe in a jurisdiction. That's not what Rush Dooney's saying. Right. Here. Rush Dooney believed in the jurisdictional separation between church and state. We're not calling on the church to do this. It's a separate jurisdiction. It's a separate government. It deals it deals with those things related to the ecclesia, to the the community of the, the church. The church was it, which is in fact a, a a community. It's not a separate. It's not a separate political entity at all. But again, I mean, even Michael Brown gets this wrong. Then he quotes Pat Robertson again. Then he says, focusing on the concept of taking America back, D. James Kennedy said, our job is to reclaim America for Christ, whatever the cost. As the vice regents of God, we are to exercise godly dominion and influence over our neighborhoods, our schools, our government, our literature and arts, our sports arenas, our entertainment media, our news media, our scientific endeavors, in short, over every aspect and institution of human society. Now, Michael Brown goes on, to be sure, none of these leaders advocated a forceful, let alone military, takeover of America, let alone of the whole world in Jesus' name. Absolutely not. But they did clearly teach that as followers of Jesus and using his spiritual authority, where we were to take dominion over every area of society until the world became Christianized, which is why this teaching is known as dominionism. Now, so, okay, so I'm a Christian. I start a business. I have dominion over that business. Right. I apply God's word to that business. And so Chick-fil-A starts chicken places around and they're having dominion in the chi- in selling chicken sure. business. Yeah. And they are they are uh, in terms of number of stores and so forth, they are they are listed number 1 yeah. in terms of Hobby Lobby is another organization. Uh, they've taken over the the that particular area. Are they forcing anybody to go no. to their places to buy and chicken? They've gotten there by providing a quality product, a good product that people actually want and being a Christian. Right. It, it's it it's so their Christianity influences how and, they and, run their business. And, and by the way, it's not just because they profess to be Christians. If you if a person just professes to be Christians and starts a business, that's one thing. Yeah, putting a fish on their business card. Yeah, 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 I see that all the time. Yeah. I'm always, I'm always a little leery of that. It's it's a person who doesn't necessarily profess, but acts in it's terms right, right. of what Christianity and what God's law has yeah, to say. Yeah, don't tell me you're a Christian. Show me you're yeah, a Christian. Yeah, yeah. And that's dominion. Dominion isn't forced compliance. I mean, obviously, there's some things that are forced. In terms it does. Of it does. It does have unfortunate connotations when when you think of the word dominion. It it, it does sound forceful. But yeah, that, but that's not that's not, not that's and if you read, I mean, I'm looking over here, I'm looking over here on my shelves of what Rush Dooney is, is is written on all this, and Gary North has written and so forth, and others have written. We we believe in a very minimal civil government. Yeah. Um, you no one is forcing you to to come in where we're having dominion in the area of education and forcing you to come to our schools. And that's why the Constitution could essentially be written on one page of paper. You know, yeah. it, it really isn't that that big of a document. It's 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 a very very small to the point. This is how this is how this government gets gets to be run because the people themselves were chained down. The people themselves they they were self governed. So we didn't need to have yeah. all these. When the people become unself governed, when the people become rebellious, then you need a top down government agency or a huge government to be the chain. Yeah, and and what's and because Christians look. Dominion is an inescapable concept. Right. You've got to keep this in mind as well. Somebody is always exercising dominion. 
And then the definition of dominion is extremely important. But right now, secularists, materialists, are they have dominion over us. And they are the ones who are forcing us to compliance. They are the ones who are taking tax money from, from us and giving it to other people. They are the ones uh, who are, who are uh, spending money they, they do not have. Right. They're the ones right. who are exercising dominion in an unbiblical, unethical immoral way we're funding their tyranny yeah yeah well we are by four yeah we are we are forced we are being forced to fund their ter- their tyranny yeah. that wouldn't be the case when christians get, get involved in dominion we do we want to have dominion in the area of government not to use it as a sledgehammer right. on people but to force to force it to do only what it's supposed to do in terms of its limited jurisdictional power and authority amen brother amen yes all right preach it <laughs> Preach, preach, as David Shannon, Chocolate Knox would say. So we've got uh, quite a few copies, actually, of Reduction of Christianity. That's available at AmericanVision.org. Uh, make sure you get one of those. If if you have it yourself, get get a dozen copies and and uh, give it out to your church. Maybe do a Sunday school uh, class on it. That would be it, it's a it's a great it's a great book. Like I said, it's a it's a good um, primer to the Christian worldview, and it it, it talks just about everything. Um, and it's, it's going to lead to a lot of profitable discussions in your, yeah, in your th- class. I tell you, I, I'm, I'm looking through this, and I really can't believe I, you know, Peter and I <laughs> cranked this thing out. Yeah, uh, it was Gary North who said, "Hey, we need this book." And uh, Peter Lightheart was working here when that happened. His chapters are very good because he deals with the with the, uh, the history of all of this. Okay. It's, it's footnoted and so forth, and it has a. Um, uh, has an appendix uh, by by uh, the late Greg Bonson. This this world and the king and the kingdom uh, has some cre- creedal formulations in the back. But uh, this is this really is a very very good book. And like I say, when it first came out, we could not keep it in stock. Okay, yeah, and, and let's keep that going again. So let's get this let's get this book sold out so that we have to print more. The reduction of Christianity. Reduction of Christianity. I'll put a link in the show notes. Thank you for listening to today's episode of the Gary DeMar Podcast. If you have any questions for future shows, email podcast at AmericanVision.org, podcast at AmericanVision.org, and we'll catch you next time. Thanks for podcasting with Gary DeMar. Please subscribe and share this with anyone you think really needs to hear it.